Brothers Carlton.
worship service this morning, I'd like to ask that you give me names of those people who are sick and shut in, who are bereaved, and that we lift up a special prayer for them. So could we start over here? And the Colson, Frank, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. Anybody else? Over on this side. Gloria Johnson. Gloria Johnson. Okay. Oh, and uh, Shereen Palmer. All right, Shereen Palmer. Well, we may not be able to uplift all of them, but we may miss someone, but think about them as we come to the throne of grace. Yeah. Let's pray. God, we do not know what these our friends need. Whether they are bereaved family, suffering loss, or their family with loved ones who are ill and not able to be here this morning. We ask that you lift them up for yes. they are down. Strengthen them at the broken places. Let them know that you are God I 
wanted to bring the fact to you that uh, Dr. Robinson is uh, is her main, is his main love and life. But I want you to also notice that I put down he's also working on his doctor. There'll be two doctors in the house pretty soon. The next one she hear after the morning worship uh, brought by the praise team will be that of Reverend Derrick Rose Roberts.
And so when we talk about ecclesia, when we talk about the gathering, when we talk about the assembly of the believers, then I understand that even though I've never met anybody in here for, uh, before today, the moment we became saved, we were all brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. We all worship the same God from the church of the living God of the, the, the edifices of our hearts. Yeah. But we are living in the world that we see because the church has outsourced the job of the church to everybody else. Mm -hmm. All right. it, it, it is not the government's job to be who God has called you to be. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not your co-worker's job. It's not the people. And I work at a Christian school, and it's still not the job of other people to be who God has called me to be. Mm -hmm. Right? And so we miss this, and we understand that as a gathering, as an assembly of believers, we are the church, whether here in Rome, Georgia, or in Rome, Italy. Mm -hmm. We, we are in the church, if we're in Athens, Georgia, or in Athens, Greece. When we're the church in Atlanta, or whether we're in Nigeria, we all represent the gathering of the assembly of believers. But the reality, and I think all of us would agree here, we are at a pivotal point in our world, and just, just for reference, I'm not even preaching it, I'm, I'm just talking right now. <laughs> we are at a pivotal point in our world, in our country, in our schools, in our churches, and in our personal lives. When, when, when we read the news reports, when, when we get the, the, the status reports, when we look at everything going around us, the news is not necessarily good. But there is a God who sits high and looks low, who is still overseeing the affairs of this world. Amen. And so there's an article that I, that I read recently, a little while ago. It was talking about two people. They were influencers. They were on social media, and they, they were Christian, and everybody was looking up uh, to them and listening to them, and they began to deconstruct their faith, and they said they didn't believe in Christianity. Part of that was they had the wrong idea of Christianity. And, and they, they dissected, but the, the author of this, this article says, there's one thing that I respect about the, their deconstruction stories. They acknowledge that Christianity means something. They understand if you cease to believe in the core tenets of the faith, like sin, the atonement, the resurrection of Jesus, and the reality of heaven and hell, then you should still identify as a Christian. In a church culture where those lines are increasingly blurred, their clarity is refreshing. And so to quote another uh, author, too often says George Barna, it seems people who are simply religious or regular church lords or perhaps people with, who want a certain reputation or image embrace the label Christian regardless of their spiritual life and intentions. Christian has become somewhat of a generic term rather than a name that reflects a deep commitment to passionately pursuing and being like Jesus Christ. I'll say that again. Christianity has become a generic term that doesn't reflect a deep commitment to passionately pursuing and being like Jesus Christ, not just in these walls, but everywhere we go. My Christianity can't cease when I leave here today. My Christianity can't cease just like I can't take, my, take off my black skin when I walk out of here today. Right? It must be not a part of me, but who I am. And so while people who meet the criteria of being born again in their theology are much more likely to hold biblical beliefs, right, some of it, only 19% have a biblical worldview. God help us. Only 6% of all American adults or 15 million people actually have what Barna calls a biblical worldview. And so today I just, want to, I just want to talk about the church. And in talking about the church, I think it's necessary to go back to a, a book that speaks about and to and through and for the churches, right? Past, present, and future, and eternally. And so our text today will come from Revelation chapter 3. Everybody's favorite book, right? We love to get in Revelation and get confused and concerned and wonder what the Lord talking about, what was done. Uh, doing when he came, when the Lord showed him all of this stuff. So Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. If you can, please, please stand for the, um, the reading of, of the Lord's word. Revelation 3, this, that's easy to find. It's all the way at the back. If you go, just go to the very last book, you're there. So chapter 3, verse 14. To so the angel of the church in Laodicea writes, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds. That you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor, nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now in my Bible, this is in red letters, so we know who's saying this. Right? We don't have to 
disciples were wondering who was talking. Here, this is Jesus. He says, You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you, Jesus says, to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So, so if Jesus is not rebuking and disciplining us, we have to ask ourselves some, some important questions, right? So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. That, that's a hallelujah right there. Amen. Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the ecclesia. Uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for your spirit. Lord, we thank you for your church, the means through which you transformed and transformed the world. We pray for this message to just be what you called it to be, Lord. Let, let everyone see your spirit in, in me. Just be a vessel. Um, it's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, uh, let's, let's, let's paint a picture here. Right, just to give us some background. So Revelation, you know, we get caught up in all this imagery and all of these things. What, what, what does it mean with the, with the, 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 the uh, beast and the dragon? What does it mean with the woman, with the child, with the beast and the dragon trying to, trying to devour? What does it mean when it talks about the Antichrist? What are all of these things? And, and, you know, not to get into deep, but it just really depends on how you interpret Revelation. But ultimately, Revelation is a letter telling Christians to resist the world's temptation, to persevere, and to overcome. It is about God's glory and ultimate triumph over sin and sinner. And the reality is, when John receives this vision, and he writes this letter, and he sends it to the church, no matter how we look at all of the imagery, John writes this letter to encourage the believer. And I believe that many of us, maybe all of us in here today, we need a little bit of encouragement. Right? We see the world around us, and, and people don't want to hear the gospel. We want to talk to people about Jesus, but they're not interested. Right? We, we love our loved ones, and we want them to come to church. We want them to be bought in. We want them to be saved, but they're not interested. We want to stand firm. We want to do all of these different things that, that glorify God. Right? But people are just not interested. But I tell you, they to, to stand firm, to overcome the world and all of the things that come with it. And so again, we believe that the church is beautiful. And so people are leaving the church and they say things like, well, the church is not doing this and the church is not doing that and, and I'm not interested in the church or the pastor did this that I didn't like, the first lady said that that I didn't like. But at the end of the day, when we go before the Lord, he's not going to ask us how the church treated us. At the end of this life, he's going to say, well, well, it's okay, I forgive you for continuously rejecting me and my people just because somebody did you wrong. And that's not to minimize church hurt. That's not to say that the church has not done things that she's not called to do. Right? But, but at the end of the day, the reality is that the church is full of broken people. Amen. It, it's amazing to me, now, we're not going to walk off our job because the supervisor looked at us <laughs> Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. right? we, we'll take it everywhere else, but it's only at the church where we're not willing to stand and fight. Some of us are still married because we said we're going to fight for our marriage. Mm -hmm. If we're honest, the first, those first few years were a little bit rocky. Uh, we had some members who they both passed um, a couple of years ago, about two years ago, but they, they would tell us, you know, we've been married for 50 plus years and the last 10 have been the best. Why? Because they continue to fight for their marriage. And, and this is the same posture. I love the imagery of bride and bridegroom, Christ and his bride and the church showing us that, that communal family and the essence of marriage and, and the importance of this family of the church. But we have to continue to fight for her. This is why Jude tells us to contend for the faith. Right? And so, we see here that this, this letter is designed to tell us to overcome. Revelation 1 and 3, I think, is one of the most important parts of Scripture. And it, and it shows why it's frustrating and unfortunate that we don't read this book 
It says, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Reading this is a blessing to its readers. And so in, in, in chapter 3, we begin with, where John addresses a couple of churches, right? The seven churches of Revelation. Now, there are more churches in these areas. Why? Because we understand it's the ecclesia, but he addresses them specifically. So to the church at Ephesus, he says, I know your works, I know your labor, and I know your endurance, but you've abandoned your first love. So essentially, the church at Ephesus, they're doing all the church things. They're working. They're worshiping. They're, 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 they're on fire for the Lord. They're doing his work. But they've abandoned him. And so, you know, when Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, he says, many people will say, didn't I do all these things in your name? And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. And so to the church at Ephesus, he says, return to your first love. If we're not doing this for the cause of Christ, then what are we doing it for? To the church of Smyrna, that name sounds familiar to us. He says, I know your affliction and poverty. You've been beaten, you've been broken, you don't have anything, but you are rich. That, that's, that, listen, that don't sound right in my ears. We, we live in America, that just don't even make any kind of sense. But they're rich because of the goodness of God. He says, be faithful even to the point of death. Yes. Yes. To the church of Pergamum, he says, I know you live where Satan's throne is. But you are holding on and not denying your faith. He's like, you're doing some good things. You're, you're standing in there. You're fighting a good fight. You're strong, he says. But you tolerate food sacrifice to idols. And you tolerate sexual immorality. And you tolerate the Nicolaitans. That's a group of, of people who claim to be Christians who thought that because of the grace of God, they should just be able to live however they want to. He's like, you're doing some good things, but just doing some good things ain't good enough. Imagine being a halfway decent spouse. <laughs> Imagine being a halfway decent parent. Imagine being a halfway decent employee. You're going to be halfway unemployed. You're going to be fully unemployed, right? He says, no, I, I want all of you. And if we're honest with us, everyone in here, myself included, we struggle with giving it all over to God. And, and part of it is because we don't trust him. But part of it is we like what we like. We don't want to give it up. But he says, no, I don't want some of you. I don't want most of you. I want all of you. Right. To Thyatira, he says, I know your works. I know your love. I know your faithfulness. I know your service. I know your service. I know your endurance. You do all these things, but you tolerate Jezebel. <laughs> he says, you cannot serve two masters. To Sardis, he says, I know your reputation for being alive, but you are dead. You literally don't look like what you are. You, you, you're nice and clean and dressed up on the outside. You're pretty. You talk a good game. You speak all the Christian needs. But it, on the inside, you're not living for God. You don't even give your heart to him. To the church of Philadelphia, right, he says, I know your works. You have little power, right, but you have kept my word and have not denied my name. He says, remain faithful. To the church at Laodicea, he says, I know your works. You're neither hot or cold. I wish you were hot or cold. And we'll talk about that in, in, in our text. But ultimately, all of these churches were surrounded by paganism and idolatry. Now, this sounds like us today, right? Now, I know that, I, you know, I live uh, uh, in Kennesaw, a little bit of ways away. But I know that the same paganism and idolatry we're facing there ain't no different than the paganism and idolatry y'all are facing right here in Rome. Why? Because it's the same world that is destroyed by sin. And so all of these churches were surrounded by paganism and idolatry, and, and these were new Christians. Christianity was a new thing. These people were, were being told to, to, to give up everything that they were used to, but God is calling them in the midst of all of this to remain faithful. And, and I want to ask you guys a question. If you arrested, if you were arrested and charged, with being a true Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you were arrested and charged with being a true, God-fearing, God-loving, God-honoring Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you, or would you get up? 
And I don't mean like you got off on the technicality. I just mean like, no, there, there ain't nothing about this that says that he or she is a Christian. And so the reality is, we bought into our own hype. We believe that we are great. We believe that we are without flaw. We believe that we are perfect. But Jesus says, I know your works. You, listen, you, you can fool Pastor Reese. Yeah. You, you can fool your friends. You can fool your family. You can definitely fool me. You can fool your coworkers. But Jesus says, I know your works. Mm -hmm. and, and we say, I go to church. I, I, I see in the choir. I lead the praise team. I, I'm a, man, I pray the doors of the church all the way down. I'm nice to people. I don't do all the bad things that others do. But Jesus says, I know your works. And the reality is this. Apart from God, our best is simply not good enough. The issue all the time is not that we're not wanting to live for and worship and honor God. The, the problem is that we're trying to do it in our own strength. And the reality is our flesh is literally warring against us. Like the world is literally warring against us. The, the, the Bible says the devil comes to kill and to steal and to destroy. Yes. But then he promises that Jesus has come so that we can have life and have it to the full. So listen, we, we need to stop operating in our own strength. I'm going to be honest with you. It, it, here's what I know, because I know myself and I know people, we ain't good enough. We will fail. We need the Lord. We, we need the Holy Spirit to, to come into our lives and, and restrain us. You know, because sometimes we, we, you know, just being honest, we do want to cuss them out. <laughs> if we're being, you know, if we're an honest church, if we're a truthful church, sometimes we just do want to cut them off and never deal with them again. Sometimes we do just want to be angry and be frustrated and do what's best for us. Right? That's human nature, but, but our best is not good enough. To, uh, verse 15, he says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, this is a section of scripture that many people misunderstand, right? He, he's not saying here, to, 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 so we think that he's saying, don't be uh, uh, one or the other. No, he's saying be hot or be cold. And, and this is contextual. So, uh, Laodicea, which is who he's writing to, is, was between two cities, right? You have Hierapolis, and then you have Colossae. Hierapolis has hot springs of water, and Colossae has cold springs of water, and, 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 and um, Laodicea sits between the two, and they have to have whichever water they need to be piped. And, you know, they didn't have the modern plumbing like us where you can just turn on the faucet for what you want, or, you know, we get real fancy, we can get both of them at the same time and just, you know, or then you go to the hotel and don't nobody know how the shower works, right? It's, it's just way too, too much, right? So, but, but they have to have this water piped in. But think about the essence of hot and cold water. Both are useful. Hot water sterilizes, right? Hot water is good for, for medicine. Listen, but I hope that, you know, I think we're all uh, great cooks in here. I hope that before we cook certain things, we boil the water and get it hot, right? Hot water is good for cooking. Listen, cold water, listen, we live in, in the South, in Georgia. In July, we don't want no hot water. We, we don't want lukewarm water. Listen, put a bunch of ice and then pour some water on it. We need cold water. Cold water is refreshing. But think about this. Lukewarm water is worthless. You, you try drinking some lukewarm water. You, you, listen, when he says, I will spit you out of my mouth, this is what lukewarm water does for us. <laughs> Ain't nobody trying to drink no lukewarm water. Either heat it or cool it, right? So he's talking here about the usefulness of the church. He's like, you're in this great city with all these wonderful things, he's like, listen, be useful. Whoever needs cold water, you need to be the cold water. Whoever needs the hot water, you need to be the hot water. Paul says, I became all things to all people so that for the sake of the gospel, I might win some. So, you know, we like to talk about, well, I'm not called to this, but sometimes the need is the call. If we're being honest, any 
anybody who's been in any sort of ministry, you probably were in ministry in a way you did not ask to be in ministry. Right? We have these visions, but ultimately the need is the call. Well, I'm not called, so I'm just going to let this person lay in the middle of the street and die. No. Get down, call 911, render whatever aid you can. Right? Be useful. So next point. So first point is apart from God, our best is not good enough. But second thing is our accomplishments are neither the most important nor the most definitive thing about us. Now, we celebrate our accomplishments. We celebrate one another, but at the end of the day, when we go before the Lord, he's, he's not checking our FIFO score. Right? He, he's not checking to, to see, like, how much money we left the bank account with. He, he's not checking to see how many great accolades we had on, on our lives, right? In verse 17, uh, uh, John, uh, Jesus tells John uh, to tell them, you say I am a rich, I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing, but you do not realize you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now again, this is accurate to the people of Laodicea, because Laodicea was known for its wealth. They had a very wealthy banking industry. They were so wealthy that in 62 AD, an earthquake leveled the city, and they rebuilt their entire city without any help from the government. Mm -hmm. They had some money, y'all. <laughs> they, they didn't have no play money either. Yeah. They had real money. They had what we would call um, wealth, right? Yeah. They, they had what we would call generational wealth, maybe. Mm -hmm. But then they had a, a great clothing industry, right? They said that you, you have, um, you don't need a thing. They had a great clothing industry. Right? And so black wool, which was very, very, well, it still is, right? very wealthy, very trendy, right? this is where it came from in, in their day. People all over the world who needed black wool, it came from Laodicea. Right? So they were wealthy, they were trendy, but then it says that you were, you were naked. You got the best clothes of the day, but you're naked. Right? And then they had a medical school. So Laodicea was just like, they were on, they had everything. They had a medical school, right? And, and, and they had eye salve. They created this eye salve for people who had eye issues that nobody else in the ancient world had. It came from Laodicea. But Jesus says, y'all are blind. Y'all are poor with all your money. Y'all are blind with all your eye salve. Y'all are naked with all your black wool. He says, everything you need you need to get from me, right? And, and, and so uh, they were forced to deal with the issue of emperor worship. People were worshiping the emperor. Well, here's one thing we know about Christianity. God tells us over and over, you can't have two gods. You can't have two masters. He, he, listen, God is like, I'm not going to beg you. Choose him. Just, just go, on, you know, to, to modernize it. Just go on with, with old you. Just go on with, with old girl. I'm not chasing you. Right? But then God does not call us to be happy. He calls us to be holy. 18 and 19, I counsel you. Jesus says, I counsel you, right? Your, your counselor is somebody who gives you advice. Your, your counselor in, in, in attorney terms tells you this is what you need to do, right? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. Like you play rich. You think you're rich. You're not actually rich. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. And so he's like, you got this idea. You, you, you think you, you're, you're hitting it out of the park, but you, you just like struck out three times in a row. <laughs> on the same man back. Figure that one out. But he's like, listen, this ain't, I'm not worried about your happiness and your contentment, although we find those things in Christ. Our identity is not in the things of this world. He's like, listen, you're supposed to be the church. Why are you the church and you out here looking like everybody else? What's the distinction between you and everybody else? How are people going to say, I need to come to Jesus for repentance, for restoration, for salvation, for the healing of my soul, for, for my future, for my eternity to be with God, if there's nothing different about the church? God is calling Christians to true repentance. That, that word repentance doesn't mean to just say I'm sorry. 
That, that word means that there is a heart transformation that leads to um, behavior transformation. Because we believe that God is good, because we owe him a debt of, that we can't pay, because Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, because of these things, I owe him my life. If he says it's a sin, it's a sin. Don't matter what the world has to say about it. He wants us to turn away from sin and turn to him. And the reality is, if we're being honest, if we really think about the things that we want, the things that are sinful, none of them are better than what God offers. This is what he's telling us here. The essence of sin is that the world has offered us something that can never satisfy. But he says, uh, he tells the lay of the say, uh, to the lay of the sins, God was not their source of happiness. We must avoid being the Laodicean church. We must avoid placing everything and everyone else in the sinfulness of our hearts above God. We must be useful. We must buy, uh, we must go to God as the source in our, of our contentment and our strength. But gold is refined in the fire to drive out impurities. Gold is put into fire to get rid of impurities and they have to heat it up very nice. To the point that it melts. So that's over a thousand degrees. But ultimately, it is for the good of the gold. But then white clothes in the Bible, especially in Revelation, signify purity. And then we see the nakedness of sin when we think of Adam and Eve in the garden after the fall. right? And they were awakened to the fact that they were naked and they were ashamed. God is trying to remove our shame by removing our sin. We don't want to go before God with shame. But then the salve that Jesus gives helps us to clearly see the truth. And so the next point, and I'm almost done. I'm almost out of here. Uh, see, Jesus does not call us to be scholars. He calls us to be saints. Right? We, 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 listen, I'm, I'm obviously pro-education. I teach, right? I come from a family of educators. My wife is a, a college professor. We, we believe in education. I'm not anti-education, but at the end of the day, Jesus does not call us to be scholars. And part of the reason why we struggle with this faith is we believe that you have to have some advanced Bible degree to, to be in this world. And because we don't have the advanced Bible degree, we believe that we only can rely on those who do have the advanced Bible degree. But then I'm reminded of, of the words of Luke, and actually he says that the Berean church was more honorable than the Thessalonican church because they went back every day and studied for themselves to see if what Paul said was true. Oh, if if y'all wonder which Paul, I'm talking about the Paul. <laughs> that Paul, right? We don't have to be scholars to get into and understand this work. And in modern technology, they have everything to help us. He's calling us to be saints. Verse 20 says, um, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and be with me. We are invited to live in communion and share meal with the creator of the universe. Now, our favorite celebrity says, come eat dinner with me, we all on board. Yeah. Our favorite author, our favorite writer, right? Whoever it is, we, we really enjoy it. They tell us to come eat with them and say, come hang out with me, we listen. We're all on board. This is what the creator of the universe has offered us. And so Jesus is calling worldly, compromising believers to repentance. And again, I'm talking to the church. Paul makes clear, he says, what business of mine is it to judge the unbeliever? Talking to the church, y'all. In case you haven't figured it out by now, this is about the assembling of the believers gathering to glorify the God in heaven. So he's calling believers to return to him in full fellowship. In full fellowship. He wants it all. Last point, a successful life outside of God's will is a failed life. Mm. 21 to him who overcomes I will give the right to sit with me on my throne I'm just reminded of the imagery of, of a child sitting in, in their, their daddy's lap or their mom's lap not caring the world nothing to worry about nothing to fear safe, taken care of covered, all that they need 
Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says to the churches. Jesus calls us to overcome the world, to overcome sin, and to overcome the spirit of compromise. And the beautiful thing about it is he's given us everything that we need. All we have to do is be faithful. John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. 1 John 4, 3, and 5, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus Christ is from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he, the enemy, the Satan who is in the world. They are from the world, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. 1 John 5, 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. We're talking about the church, y'all. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Not our arguing with people, not us telling people how they're wrong, there's, there's a place for that. Not, not us putting our, ourselves on the pedestal, our buildings on the pedestal. We overcome the world through our faith. It is our faith that it produces our ability to resist sin and to stand strong. He says, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The church is comprised of believers. The church is not made up of a body of people sitting in the The ecclesia is not made up of a, of a, of a group of people who, who love to come together to worship. It's not made up of people who just believe that their responsibility is to, to fit a role or to, or to serve in a way. And all of those things are important. But at the end of this age, if we are not believers that Jesus is the Son of God, if we're not believers that God will judge the world, that he will eventually judge all mankind, and he will only save and deliver and have those in eternity with him who have called upon the name of Jesus, we will not be able to stand before him in judgment. In my prayer, brothers and sisters, who, who I, I haven't even met, but are my brothers and sisters in the ecclesia, my prayer is that when we go before God at the end of this life, that we will be found worthy yes. to be with him, and that he will say to us, well done. Amen. Not, my, not my rich not, not my smart, not my uh, uh, handsome, beautiful, although y'all are all that. <laughs> my good and faithful servant. I have made you, you have been faithful over just a little thing. God Almighty, I, I, I will make you ruler over me. Come and enter into this joyful rest. The world does not promise us that because the world can't give us that. So I want to encourage you, and the doors of the church are open. If this does not apply to you, this only applies to the believer. This only applies to the person who says, God, I yield, I give it all up to you. This only applies to the person who says, I believe that you are the creator of the universe. I believe that what you say is wrong is wrong. I believe that the only way I am anything is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you've not already believed that, I just want to encourage you today. We don't know what will happen when we walk out these doors. We don't know what will happen before we walk out these doors. Life can change in an instant. And my prayer is that all of us will That we're something like the Laodiceans. And we're not hot. We're not cold. We're not useful. We're not serving God. And he spits us out of this land. So if that's you. If you've not. 
accepted Jesus, if you've not put all of your faith in him, if you've not yielded your life completely to him, I, I want to encourage you to do that now. I, I don't, I can't, I can't promise you another opportunity. I, I can't promise you that you'll ever enter another opportunity like this. I can't promise you that God is going to always allow these doors to be open for you. In the Bible talks about um, Esau not having a chance to repent. Even through his tears, it says, God never gave him another chance to repent for his unholiness. Hebrews 12. I, I don't want that to be my, my prayer. My hope is that every one of us is good with God. That's what I genuinely want to believe. But, but I know based on the, the statistics we read, that may not be true. And so I want to offer Christ to you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for you. If we get nothing else, if we have nothing else, but we have you, Lord, that's all we need. That's the only thing that can satisfy. You are the only one who can grant us eternal life. You are the only one who can give us life to the full. You can only, the only one who can help us to make sense of this this crazy world around us, Lord. Lord, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice who is unsaved, Lord, just call it what it is, anyone who's not put their faith in you, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will, will, will grab their heart, will arrest them, Lord, will, will show them the truth of your gospel, the truth of your word, the truth of your glory, the beauty and majesty of who you are, Lord. We fail to recognize that salvation is a gift from the best giver, and Lord, we just say thank you. But I pray that this word would just resonate, Lord, with all of us. I pray that it would renew our hearts and renew our minds and renew our spirits. And challenge us to go out and tell a dying world about the Jesus who has died for sinners. Sinners like us, Lord, each and every one of us in here. Who the only thing that matters about us is the fact that you have redeemed us. You have loved us with an unexplainable love. And so we just say thank you, Lord. We say thank you, we love you, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Our fervor, our fervor in your life. We offer the 
these gifts of time, talent, and possessions. As you have a true act of faith to reflect our love for you and our neighbors. Help us to reach out to others as you are our God and reach out to us.
Dear Lord, we just thank you for what our eyes have seen, what our ears have heard, what our hearts have felt, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you just equip us, Lord. We, we hear the word, we believe the word, but, but quite frankly, when we go out into the world, we're challenged. So, so I just pray that you would encourage us and equip us by your spirit to do your will, Lord, to, to say what you told us to say, to do what you told us to do, and to be who you called us to be. And, and Lord, I just pray that it's not just a, a tomorrow thing, it's not just this week, but that our lives are influenced and are changed and, and, uh, by your word and that we represent you in every way. And now unto him who was able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding great joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, now and forevermore.